All right, welcome. My name is Sujit Iyer. I'm the Director of Pediatric Services for U.S. Acute Care Solutions and also a Pediatric Emergency Medicine Physician here at Dell Children's in Austin, Texas. We've been asked to provide some really focused education in the context of increasing volumes, specifically on how to manage young children with bronchiolitis who may need escalating respiratory support. We're very lucky today to have two experienced providers here at Dell Children's to help us walk through care beyond the emergency department. Sam Dallafield, who's a pediatric ICU physician here at Dell Children's, and Jennifer Simpson, Director of Respiratory Therapy here at Dell Children's in Ascension, Texas. So we're going to jump right into it, and they're going to walk us through how to manage these children in the ER and beyond. This is a brief primer, and so just a reminder for those who are listening to this video, this is really the standards of one local children's hospital. Depending on your geographic area and your own equipment and supplies, we'd recommend discussing what you have available with your team, as well as what your referral centers prefer in terms of treatments and guidelines for flow rates. Remember that this primer is meant to be a focus on high flow and escalating respiratory therapy. You can find further education in Litmos on the management of children with bronchiolitis, especially for those who are going home including a standard bronchiolitis discharge education that is both in English and Spanish, a CMT, and some other recorded talks on bronchiolitis care. All right, we're gonna let Jennifer talk to us about high flow nasal cannula. Thanks, Sujit. So first we're gonna talk about what uh, high flow is. So it is a heated humidified uh, source of oxygen. It is able to provide higher flows. The way that it works is it washes out the dead space in the upper uh, respiratory tract. So that provides a mechanism so that every breath becomes 100% uh, of the oxygen that you're delivering. It also has the opportunity to wash out some of the CO2 in that upper space. Um, it does provide, because of that, it provides, um, and the added flow adds a decrease in the work of breathing, and it may provide some, although inconsistent, PEEP. So here we're going to walk through actually how to set up high flow nasal cannula through one system. Your own equipment may vary and your own local respiratory therapist should know how to set this up, but we're going to walk through the basic steps of this as well as the types of equipment that we use and how we then manage these settings. At Dell Children's, we use the uh, OptiFlow Junior 2, um, but all of the devices have similar um, mechanisms. And so you're going to have some sort of a pole to rest all these on. You'll have a blender that allows you to manipulate the FiO2. You should have at least two flow meters on here just for a backup and for placement of your anesthesia or, or Ambu bag. Um, you'll have heater brackets to hold the heater and then there's some pigtails that go into the heater to make sure that um, it connects to the circuit. Perfect. We could talk about the, dispos mm -hmm. the disposable equipment can vary depending on which type that you use. Again, we use the Fisher and Patel version. Um, that version comes with a kit, but it'll essentially have a water cha chamber with a uh, large bore circuit. Um, you'll need some um, sterile water bag for inflammation. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You'll have a sterile water bag for inhalation um, that will support the humidity and then the prongs um, that fit on the end of that large bore uh, tubing um, that are sized for pa different patient sizes. Those cannulas do have specific flow rates. So make sure that you're looking at that before you throw away the box. Great, that's a good point. All right, so why don't you walk us through how you would teach somebody to set this up? So the main point of the cannula sizing and the flow is that the cannula does have to support the flow. So we do later in this, in this presentation give you some recommended flow rates. However, going above the flow rates that are specific to the cannula can cause some shearing um, if run too, fat, too high through the cannula. So you do wanna make sure that you're paying attention to uh, the max flow rates that are involved in here. And Jen, your audio may have just cut off for just a second here. So just, um, I think your main, your main point here is just making sure that you read the box for the settings, right? Yes. Thanks. All right. What about the equipment setup? Okay. So to start, um, you'll place the heater chamber, you'll place the chamber on the heater. 
um, you'll add the adapter to the heater. So this is where it may vary a little bit by site, but there's usually a mechanism that will have some sort of a pop-off or a control for the flow. Um, and then the last step is putting the, uh, the large bore tubing onto the adapter and then placing it on the other side of the heater. So the idea is that flow is coming from oxygen tubing, going through a pop-off valve, going through the water, collecting humidity, and then coming back out of the large bore tubing. Great. Last couple steps here with the heater wire. So next you'll attach the heater wire and pigtails according to the heater that you're using. Um, those will connect directly to the large bore tubing. Um, there's typically a place to put it by the heater and then also by the patient so that you can identify whether the patient is getting that, that set uh, humidified temperature that you're looking for. Great. And you talk about the prongs a little bit uh, when you're attaching the prongs on, um, again, you want to make sure that you're looking at the size of the cannula and you right. want to make sure that you're not, the size of the cannula prongs inside the nose should not occlude more than 60% of the nair. When you occlude more than 60% of the nair, you could be um, inadvertently giving inconsistent peak levels. And so you want to have that room for the air to escape back out of the nostrils. Great. That's a great point. This shows maybe a little bit of it too, about how you set it up on their face. So on, um, on these babies, one thing that we noticed is that not all babies like having cannulas on their face. Um, we do have what are called wiggle pads that are specific to our device here, um, but these offer for um, a way to have a set, um, a set interface or a set, um, place to secure the cannula so that if the baby does rip the cannula off, it's a Velcro piece that comes off and doesn't tear their skin. Uh, we noticed that even with this, um, it was hard to keep the cannula on. So we have come up with a way to prevent this. If you use trach ties and go behind the back of the neck when the baby pulls on the cannula, um, they'll pull on the back of that trach tie and pull kind of on the back of their neck as opposed to pulling the whole thing off their face. So just a little tip and trick that may work for you. Again, you don't want to, when you're sizing the cannula, you don't want to include more than 60% of the nares and you do want to watch for skin issues. Great, yeah. This is a really fine art, I would say, in keeping these on. Sam, I don't know if you have any other tips on uh, what you guys focus on in ICU. Uh, for these kids who've been on it for a while? I don't think so. The wiggle pads are actually really nice because like she said, they're Velcro. So if they do pull it off, then it just ends up pulling the Velcro, pulling Velcro off of the wiggle pads with those stay on the face. And so it's prevented us from having um, skin injuries related to these. Great. The other lesson, sorry, excuse me, the other yeah. lesson that I would also say is that that uh, where the cannula kind of goes up and cinches, that piece mm -hmm. can get pretty hard. And so you mm -hmm. always do want that in the front, which is why we have kind of a tip and trick for how they pull it. Putting it back behind the head um, can, be, can be difficult and lead to skin issues if they're laying on it. Got it. That's a good tip. Um, <clears throat> The blender is uh, pretty simplistic. It'll just give you a readout of the FiO2. You can change the FiO2 by dialing either right or left. Um, all of them are universal. So at the uh, far left, you're gonna be at the lowest flow rate at 20, all the way down to 21%. And then at the extreme right, you would be at 100%. Great. Um, the heater, again, it, this is really the key for bronchiolitis and for high flow is that you're adding this warm humidified air. Um, it is required to use, for use for high flow cannula. Without it, you would um, have some drying of secretion. So you want to make sure that the heater is functioning appropriately. Um, you can do this by um, looking at the alarm. We have a picture here of what our heaters look like, but they typically, they typically all have some sort of an alarm system that will 
uh, alerts you when there's something going on with the alarm. Um, you do want to make sure that you are emptying um, any tubing water that you might see. As you can imagine, when you add humidity and it's going through a cold circuit, you can get some rain out. So emptying that um, circuit water will help with having a consistent FiO2. Um, you definitely don't want to turn off the heater unless instructed by your therapist or somebody that's familiar with the heater. Um, just again, because that can lead to some drying. So you really, because of these higher flows, you do not want to leave a patient unhumidified for any period of time. Um, on the flow meter itself, um, it's the same type of flow as off the wall um, that you're used to seeing, but it uses a blender. So regardless of the liter flow, your FiO2 that's being delivered is gonna be the same. So if I'm on a two liter cannula and I have the blender set at 50%, you're gonna be delivering 50%. If I have it at um, five liters per minute um, at 50%, you're still gonna get that 50%. So now you have a little bit of a difference between the flow that you're delivering and the amount of FiO2 that you're delivering. Yeah, great. I think that's a really good point. I think Sam will talk a little bit. There, there are two separate settings that we're thinking about, both flow and FiO2 and what the kid needs um, may be different for each of those components. So let's get right into the do's and don'ts of high flow nasal cannula now that folks are using this more in the community. So you do want to understand that the FiO2 is not perfect, but one of the things that we saw here initial early on in our um, high flow journey was that um, there was a misunderstanding of where high flow sits as, as opposed to our regular nasal cannula and um, simple mass and non rebreathers. So this is not perfect. It's obviously going to give different FiO2s depending on the patient size. However, um, just a simple guideline is 21 to 28% is usually about a one to two liter cannula. 35 to 60 is usually a five to 10 liter simple mask. And then above that, you're going to a non rebreather. Um, the FiO2 on the high flow can go up to 100%. So it's, it's always going to be giving a higher um, amount of oxygen on the high flow than you can on any of these systems. So switching from a high flow to one of these systems is usually going to be a downgrade. Um, the flow, the way that we set and decide the flows are um, really dependent on auscultation. The way that we do it here, if you give too high of an auscult, uh, too high of a flow rate, you can actually impede and make work of breathing worse. So you wanna make sure that you're hitting just what they need for their flow demand and not going above. Since there's not a one size fits all flow demand and it's very patient specific, the way that we identify this is through auscultation. So if you're listening to auscultation and you hear what we call a CPAP whoosh, uh, which is that loud, uh, turbulent flow, you may need to, de in the chest, then you may need to decrease the flow rate. You may be delivering too much flow. Um, suctioning the nares to improve delivery, um, you want to make sure that you're doing this, but not doing it too often. So if you're doing it too often, you're going to inflame the nose to make things worse. Um, typically, we assess suctioning every four hours. Here is a general rule. Doesn't mean that they have to be suctioned every four hours, but you do want to keep it clear without uh, causing any further inflammation. That can be kind of a delicate balance. You never want to ignore heater volumes. That heater, um, that temperature can get too high. Um, you never ever want to turn off the flow with the heater on. So this can scald the patient. So even though the flow is off, there is a buildup of heat in that circuit and that can transition to the nares. So great point. Um, and just as a reminder from previous education we've done that when we do suctioning here, we focused on nasal suctioning with saline drops. We use mushroom tip catheters. We don't um, do vigorous deep tracheal suctioning as the evidence is not uh, great that that helps. And so we're trying to clear the upper airway. Sam, I don't know if you have other thoughts on suctioning tips um, when you have these kids in the ICU also. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in the ICU, all bets are kind of off, right? So yeah. even though the data doesn't support the deeper nasal tracheal suctioning in an ER setting, um, you know, when they when they come to us, if if it's really seeming like they're just packed full of snot, 
sometimes really clearing that out can help them to, to see the flow and the support that we're giving through high flow. That is not something that I'm doing frequently, but if initially I need a one time to really try to clear them out so they can see the flow, um, we, will, we will do that. But again, don't wanna do that too much because then it can just worsen your problem, worsen inflammation um, and make, make the patient worse off. Yeah, thanks. That's a great point. Yeah, that's kind of for the one-off, really, really sick kid at one time. Yep, thanks. So let's talk a little bit about once you get these kids started on high flow and then titration specifically. So the goal of the um, of our FIO2 needs is really when you're looking at FIO2, you want to make sure that you're hitting 90%. Once you hit 90% SpO2, um, there's really not any um, benefit that you're getting out of giving them more. Um, as far as the flow, um, that's the second thing that you're going to look at. Um, that's to improve worker breathing. Now, this won't make them magically stop uh, breathing fast. It won't. Um, it won't necessarily make everything appear absolutely better. But you should see that after um, a short period of time, that you start seeing just a little bit of relief on these patients. Um, you should see some improved aeration, um, a little bit of decreased work of breathing. And, and really what we look at probably more than anything is that they're alert and playful again, looking at the child and making sure that they look like they are um, a little more childlike and playful and not just laying there and very lethargic um, is really a good indicator of whether or not this is, is working. Um, we start the flows somewhere between 1.5 and 2 liters. Uh, we assess every 15 minutes for the first hour in the, in the ED. Um, the max just depends on the local practice. It often, in acute care areas um, or areas that don't have as much monitoring, um, will go to a 2 liter per kilo max. Um, sometimes in the, in the ICU areas or where you have more monitoring, you can go a little higher if needed, but again, you want to really make sure that you're not giving too much flow um, where you're actually exasperating the problem and making it harder for them to breathe against. Uh, feeding can vary widely, um, and I will let, um, I will <laughs> I'll turn it over to my partner here for, for this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could talk a little bit about this. Um, so, you know, oftentimes if a patient's coming in, you know, breathing 60 times a minute and looking distressed, that's not a patient that I'm necessarily is, I'm going to feel comfortable allowing to take PO um, with the concern being that they're just not going to be able to control the food with the flow and the work of breathing and they have the risk of aspiration. That being said, that hasn't been um, that hasn't been often shown in the in the literature. So we're getting a little bit more liberal in terms of who we allow to feed on high flow and at what flows it's appropriate. Um, so it's it's just a little for me it's a little patient dependent. The patient who has a respiratory rate in the sixties but is um, you know, grunty and tracheal tugging is probably not the kid that I'm gonna feel comfortable with versus the patient that's breathing in the 60s, has some subcostal and intercostal retractions, but it is overall alert and playful. That patient I'm gonna feel is, is what should be totally fine. And, and I was gonna to touch a little bit more on this um, in a slide later on, but sometimes if a patient is super hangry, then, um, allowing them a little PO just to calm them down and decrease their metabolic demand can actually help them not work so hard. So it is a balance. I mean, you just kind of have to use your intuition with, about which patient's going to be appropriate for that. Sometimes we do use NGs, OGs, or NJs if you do feel like they are high um, aspiration risk. Um, but I would think about that um, in line with um, guidance at your own institution. Yeah, I think these are all good points. I think the big point and starting from the top is just looking at the kid, uh, both in identification on whether or not the high flow is helping. It's not just simply looking at the respiratory rate as a single marker or simply looking at the SAT. It's really the overall picture of is this child more comfortable or not? The goal is not to make them look perfect. And that's really how we initiate high flow. And then, you know, getting into feeding, it's, it's almost the same answer. There's some children who are very, very comfortable and happy being to Kipnik and in the ER, well, we won't 
necessarily make a big bottle for them, but giving them even just a little bit of Pedialyte, a little bit of sucrose water can just calm them down and get them calm. And, and it honestly can alleviate the anxiety of staff if you're having trouble getting an IV or maybe not comfortable placing pediatric IVs. These are great tips. So what about a drop in O2 saturation? Uh, Jen, how do you approach this when you first hear a kid on high flow drops their sats? I think the first thing that we look at is really um, is um, the patient getting the that we expect them to. So making sure that the cannula is in the nose and not you know off to the side and, and they're just getting kind of a blow by. We'll also look to make sure that they're not bent or, or occluded um, or, you know, in an incorrect position. Um, we'll increase the FO2 in small increments, so 5 to 10%. Um, and then if it's escalating above 50%, we have, we typically will ask that the nurse call the provider, the RT here, but that's also a local um, standard. And that's just to make sure that everything is uh, really working the way that it's supposed to. Um, if apneic, of course, we'll begin bagging um, and call for help. Um, and one of the things that uh, we teach our staff here is really uh, making sure, as Suja just said, making sure that the kid's calm. Sometimes when they're crying, they open their mouth. You're, they may not, they may be forcing out some of that flow or where they need more flow because their mouth is open. Um, so really looking at those um, things and making sure that the patient's calm is going to be ideal. Yeah, great, great points. And make sure that you have a bag valve mask ventilation, uh, bag valve mask, I'm sorry, set up in the room too. In addition, if you if you have a kid on high flow, make sure that your room is prepared for some of these complications also. Okay, so this is a common question that we get now that um, folks in the community are having to manage these devices, which is what's the flow rate that I start on? Well, if I've been holding a kid for hours, if not a day, how do I even then use this use this machine, especially what if the kid's getting a little bit better? So Jen, I'd love to kind of for you to walk us through this and then Sam, you can kind of add on to if you've had thoughts on this. Yeah, so we have a little chart here, but um, realistically, we're that ideal flow rate is very variable patient to patient. Um, what you're getting here is kind of your higher end ideal flow rate. So if you do start at these, you really want to auscultate to make sure that you're not giving too much flow and feel free to um, go below these amounts if needed. So these are not, uh, if you set, if you have a one kilo kid and you set it on two uh, liters per minute, doesn't mean that that's not going to be too much for them. So just because that number is there doesn't mean that it's an absolute. It's really just a starting point for you to go max and then kind of turn down. Um, and then it goes up by size at Dell Children's. Um, in the acute care areas, we do cut off our max flow at 14. Again, these cannulas can go higher than that. Some of them can go as high as 60 liters per minute. Um, however, we rarely will use that type of flow. And if you have to go higher than that, um, you really want to make sure that you have some more monitoring and some more expert eyes that are constantly watching them. Um, Sam, do you have any, any feedback on the flow rates before I go into the holiday? Um, no, all, all that is, all that is great. There was a study that came out a few years ago that looked at flow rates and where patients were seeing improvement in their work of breathing, um, and less than eight kilos. It was often about one and a half per kilo. And then above eight kilos, it was closer to two per kilo. So that's kind of where we find this. Um, and, and where anecdotally we, we see that improvement is somewhere around that one and a half to two liters. But um, I often recommend to like, just try to finesse it, listen to your patient, turn up the flow, turn down the flow. You know, maybe, you know, if you're set at 10, go to 12, go to eight, see if it changes your patient's work of breathing, see if it changes the aeration on auscultation and um, and you can often get a sense of maybe you're providing too much flow and so the patient's kind of fighting against it, um, or maybe they really do need higher flow and that improves, um, that in, improves their work of breathing and, and helps, um, helps calm them a little bit. So good starting point, but, but finesse it a little bit using your clinical exam. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then Jen, you talked a little bit about holidays. So, you know, some of these places may be holding kids for hours or maybe days on high flow. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, the American Association of Pediatrics um, this past year came, came out with um, a study looking at um, high flow cannula and how long should we keep them on, on these devices and how do you wean it? And so the, the common thought was once they don't need it, they don't need it at all. And so um, they did some studies looking at, let's, let's try turning it off and see how the kid does. And there really wasn't too much difference once the kid got past the initial need. And so um, our process here at Dell Children's is every um, once a shift or BID um, after the first four hours, we're really trialing the patient off or severely decrease. So if they're on a two to a eight liter flow rate, then we go straight to room air. And in that first five minutes, are we seeing an increase in heart rate, respiratory rate? Do they look like they're in distress? If so, then we put them immediately back on and we wait, uh, wait to do weaning. Um, if they're on higher flows, we can still do um, these tests. We just go to a two liter regular nasal cannula for a trial um, and do the same thing. We look at heart rate, respiratory rate, are they having um, decreases in their FiO2s? And so um, we do this once a shift just to make sure that we're not lingering on this high flow, which is, which can be a problem. Yeah, I think what you said was probably the best point, which is at some point during this illness and disease, once they don't need it, they don't need it, right? And, and so understanding that there's a peak of this illness and then eventually that peak goes away. Sam, I don't know if you have, um, you know, you're the, you're the ones who end up getting these kids off high flow eventually, kind of some guidance on the signs that you see that kind of maybe indicate to you, okay, this may be the time that it's time to um, consider doing holiday. Yeah, I, I think I had seen a question about the, the peak of this illness. And yeah. we usually think about these viruses being their worst sometime around three, four or five days of illness. So if you're seeing a kid on day two, I'm going to be a lot more concerned that that patient may really be getting worse versus if you have a patient that's on day five, maybe you just need to help them over the peak. Um, but even in the ICU, we have seen a lot of success from this protocol of just trialing them off. Um, now that's not a patient who was really sick on BiPAP. Yeah. Um, these are, these are your patients that, um, seem to be more comfortable. They are active. They want to play. They're interested in eating. Um, even, you know, even if they don't look perfect, they still have a little dyspnea or some, you know, mild intercostal attractions. Sometimes that is no different on room air or on two liters of a regular cannula versus high flow. So don't be afraid to try. You can always put it back on if um, if they look significantly worse. Yeah, and I, you know, probably the last caveat I'll say for our community providers is that I don't think I would have ever imagined we'd be having a talk about putting people on a holiday for a community ED. So we're really bringing this up in the context of the current state. Um, most of us in the ED are initiating this while kids are in their peak. And so um, we're really talking about this in the context of people who are boarding these patients for an excessively long period of time. Again, still getting guidance from your referral centers, understanding that the children's hospitals may just have more resources and time to do this. But but we are finding that some communities are getting caught in these situations. So we wanted to talk about this, especially if you're holding kids for a long period of time. So um, although you cannot see this PDF clearly, I'm going to just mention this to kind of close this topic out of weaning. This attachment will be provided as a supplement to this video, but um, Jen, can you just talk a little bit about this algorithm of how we think about weaning in a holiday? Sure. So yeah. like I said, we um, if a patient's been on high flow and it's been more than four hours, we, we don't touch them in the first four hours. You spend all that time trying to find the perfect flow. We don't want to backtrack. But after four hours, um, we'll look at some criteria to see if they're ready. Um, again, they have to meet a certain criteria like Sam was um, suggesting. The patient looks good. They look like they're playful. And then they also meet this criteria that um, the patient is less than 40% FiO2, um, that they're, they're setting well on that state, 
their heart rate is within normal limits, um, and that we have a bronchiolitis score here that we that helps us guide. Um, and so as long as they're under uh, a certain number on that pathway score, um, then we would start. If they're not meeting those criteria, we leave them alone. They're still in their, their um, they're still in, in a um, higher um, setting of the bronchiolitis disease or pathway. And so um, if they do meet the criteria, then we look at um, whether or not the, um, that all flow um, with FIO2 above 21% um, will go to a uh, two liter cannula. So if they're needing oxygen, we don't wanna take all oxygen away. Um, and so we would go to that two liter cannula. If um, the flow rate is really high, then we would also go to the two liter cannula and then we monitored them um, for a minimum of five minutes to make sure that we're not gonna see some kind of delayed deterioration. And then we will go back and reassess them every 30 to 60 minutes to make sure that they're still staying on there. If they, if they at the end of that, they would either not pass, in which case we would return to our previous high flow setting. Um, and not passing would be now you're seeing pretty severe work of breathing. So an increase in retractions or severity, um, their heart rate goes up by at least 20 beats per minute. Um, they have an increased respiratory rate by more than 10 beats per minute. Um, that would indicate we need to go back onto the high flow. Um, they may pass, um, but need to stay on the low flow nasal cannula, which means um, everything, all of their vitals are in the right category, but they're still um, not keeping their sats the way that we want to, then we would keep the nasal cannula on them. Mm -hmm. um, and then if everything is in place and we're still seeing um, SpO2s above that 90, we would further wean them um, down on their nasal cannula like we normally would by like one liter per minute until they're off. Great. Yeah, that, that's a great way of kind of explaining them what do you do as you're weaning. We'll have this as a, a supplemental attachment. We'll also have a supplemental attachment of our bronchiolitis score. Just keep in mind that the score that we use is extremely local. It's not a validated respiratory score in the literature, but we use it to communicate on how the kid is doing, most importantly, how they're doing over time um, to just keep that in context. So let's kind of get into um, the expertise of the ICU providers and signs of a child worsening and high flow nasal cannula escalation, because this is what most of us worry about. So uh, Sam, you kind of walk us through like, what are some of your red flags? And then how do you approach escalation when the kid actually, instead of looking better, seems to be looking worse? Yeah, you know, I feel like this is um, this is so our bread and butter that some of this feels very um, routine for us. But if you're not seeing these kids all the time, then it can be a little hard to tease out you know, what is progression of respiratory distress? Um, you know, and, and when we talk about that, we're not necessarily talking about just tachypnea. I've seen patients breathing 70 times a minute, but for all intents and purposes, they otherwise look pretty good. So I don't love them breathing 70 times a minute, but they're still alert and they're still kind of playful and they are robust and not, um, you know, they're not like that lethargic patient with decreased alertness who um, just kind of looks puny. Um, those are the patients that I'm going to worry, worry about. Um, so I would say if you're having tachypnea, significant tachypnea in conjunction with some of these other things on this list, that would be more concerning. Um, if you have a decreasing O2 sat despite an FiO2 above 50%, that is more concerning. Um, if you need to turn your FiO2 above 50%, obviously do what you need to do to support the patient and help them saturate normally. But that does indicate to us that there may be something else going on or they may be a bit sicker um, and, and, and they may need more support. Um, apnea, specifically, we see this um, in RSV in very little babies. Um, it's actually not uncommon for those kids to ha have apnea. So you just want to be prepared for that. Again, have a bag mask um, available for those patients. Make sure you have a mask that is size appropriate for the little kids. Um, you know, um, but, you know better than me, if you can bag a patient, you can save a patient. So just make sure you have those tools in case you get into this setting. 
Sometimes with those patients that are having apnea, if we can get them on some flow, you can decrease the apneas and, and sometimes not, it just persists. And oftentimes those kids um, end up being intubated. Um, rapid worsening, so again, this is kind of subjective, but if you feel like you're increasing flow and they kind of look better and then they're worse and you increase flow and they're worse and they just seem like they're escalating and their work quickly, um, then we worry that those kids are going to progress to needing BiPAP or, or intubation. And then important that these devices work pretty quickly. So if you're not seeing improvement in the first 90 minutes to a couple hours, then you're probably not going to see improvement on that um, on whatever that support is that you're on and you're probably going to need more. So if we're seeing any of these signs, one thing is just to try to increase your flow. Remember, I think about flow and FiO2 in silos. FiO2, I titrate to SATs. Flow, I titrate to work of breathing. So often I'm going up in two liter per minute increments um, or down, just depending on what you're seeing. Um, but you know, often up if the patient seems to be doing worse. Um, to a max. And for me, that's usually two liters per kilo. Anecdotally, um, I don't usually see um, any significant change over two liters per, or two per kilo for a patient. So if I'm over that or, or if I'm at that threshold, I'm normally thinking about BiPAP. Um, so think about, um, define a max at your site. Um, and, and if you are on that max flow or max FiO2, consider a chest x-ray. Um, it's not uncommon for these kids to have, well, you know, maybe not common, but it's possible for these kids to have secondary bacterial infections or pneumonia, right? Something is making these kids worse from RSV than every other child in the community. So maybe it's just the RSV, but it's possible that they have something else going on as well. And then consider a blood gas. This doesn't necessarily have to be an ABG. A VBG or a CBG will give you a ballpark on what their CO2 level is. And that um, that is helpful to, to um to, to clue you in on whether or not they're keeping up on their ventilation. Um, and then you'll want to think about BiPAP or CPAP if you're reaching those max flows. And I'll um, talk about that in a slide later on. And then ensure good PIV access. You're thinking about what am I going to do with this patient if they're not better? Um, if, am I going to need to intubate them? Am I going to need other things? And so ensuring you have good IV access is important at this stage. Great. Yeah. These are all perfect red flags, hopefully for the kids that we don't see, but in the case you get caught in these situations, keep these things in mind. So uh, why don't you walk us through some of your top tips as you get patients referred to you? Yeah, I, I would say that, um, you know, by and large, I would probably two thirds of the patients that I see in the PICU or more, we can get by on high flow. So really the patients that are needing progression to BiPAP or needing progression to intubation, that is the is really the minority. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and sometimes once they get to me, I'm actually decreasing the flow or I'm doing these simple things, suctioning them to make sure they're actually getting the flow, treating their fever. If a kid is febrile to 103, they're gonna be working harder and generally feeling uncomfortable, hydrating them if they look um, dehydrated or considering a feed if they look particularly hangry and otherwise seem like they could tolerate it. This is really all about decreasing their metabolic demand. And if you can do some of these things, um, they, they won't work so hard and they'll, they'll look better in front of you and, <laughs> and you'll feel better. Um, other things, consider albuterol. The literature doesn't, you know, support that albuterol is, is globally helpful in these patients, but in your, especially older children, which we are seeing more of right now with RSV um, than in previous years, and for those that have either a family history or a personal history of allergies, eczema, asthma, um, sorry, I left asthma off the slide here. Those are the patients that I'm going to try albuterol just to see if it helps. And so you just want to listen before, give them a treatment, even, you know, five milligrams and listen afterwards and see if you see any improvement. And if so, maybe that's something that you can continue to really help decrease, um, uh, Im improve their work of work of breathing overall. And we already talked about thinking about secondary bacterial infections or pneumonia that could be worsening their work of breathing. And then this is that study that I talked about earlier, looking at less than eight kilos and greater than eight kilos and where they saw improvement 
um, in terms of the high flow um, cannula flow rate. But again, really try to finesse it. Like I said, I've seen patients admitted and then I turned down the flow by four liters and they look better. They were just fighting the flow. The flow was more turbulent and making it harder to breathe. Um, and then, you know, as the ICU doc, I always have to say, prepare for no improvement, right? So again, think through those steps. Do you have masks for your bag, your bag masks that are appropriate size for these patients? Um, you know, intubation equipment that's going to be appropriate for these sizes. And then, you know, who, who is your lifeline? Um, if you're stuck in a situation where, um, you, you know, you really don't know how to proceed, who can you call to try to help you um, virtually until you can get this patient um, somewhere where they can offer them more support? Yeah, those are great tips. Um, yeah, so the question about BiPAP comes up um, a lot. And I think you could understand that if you're in the community ED setting, seeing adults where there may be more comfort using those interfaces, um, I do think that the approach and when we use this in kids is a little bit different. And so I really would love your input on the thought of BiPAP in the community ED setting. Jen, you can kind of add on to, again, I think these represent a very slim, slim minority of the overall patient population. Um, however, we do know that these patients are existing. So I thought we'd make a little note of it. Yeah, I think, I mean, again, usually high flow, oftentimes, by and large, high flow is going to be enough to get to get you through. Um, but when you think a patient just needs a little bit more support, but may not need intubation, but just needs a little, a little more support, you, you can think about BiPAP or CPAP. Like this may not be something that you're going to feel comfortable with on children or that you even have the interface or equipment to, to do. Um, obviously, different sized children require different masks. Even in our hospital, which is a pediatric institution, sometimes we have trouble finding just the right mask to fit the patient. So step one is really figuring out if you even have the interface or equipment to do this, or are you really going to be bypassing these? And these are the kids that, that you're going to end up intubating or really just checking blood gases on, make sure, making sure they're ventilating, making sure they're oxygenating and trying to buy them, um, you know, temporize them with high flow. You know, my second tip is choose BiPAP and that is totally a personal thing. This is probably <laughs> widely different depending on which intensivist you talk about, talk to, but because high flow is maybe providing some kind of inconsistent peep, especially on higher flows, if I've already got that, I'm probably just going to choose BiPAP. Yeah. And then I just pick a place to start. 12 over six is my happy place. Um, that's usually what I throw out. Um, and then I listen to the patient, um, to assess whether or not I need to adjust. So if they're not having, if, if they don't have good aeration on the settings or if we're on a lot of FiO2, I'll increase their EPAP or their PEEP to see if I can improve their aeration or decrease their FiO2. And then you can look at the measured tidal volume on your circuit. Now, you need a good seal um, in order to reliably look at your tidal volume, but I usually adjust my IPAP or my delta P um, to target six to seven mLs per kilo for these patients. Um, and then obviously titrating your FiO2 to your appropriate saturation, that's the easy part. And then you have to decide if it's working. So, um, you know, I think of somewhere around like 18 over eight being pretty decent BiPAP settings. And if I've given them, you know, really 30 minutes to max an hour without improvement, or you still have a blood gas, it's looking like they're not ventilating adequately, it may be time to intubate them. Yeah, great. These are great, great tips. Again, I think step one is where you have to talk about first, which is if you have the equipment and the team to help them. But if you do happen to have it, I think this is a great place to start. Um, and I'm always amazed by how you can get these masks to fit. That's to me, the art of this all. So I want to thank you. I know this is a little bit long, but hopefully this is a great resources for providers who are having to do this in the community. I want to thank Sam Dowfield, our pediatric critical care physician here, Jennifer Simpson, our RT director here at Dell Children's in Ascension, Texas, and at Dell Medical School. We hope you find this helpful. Please leave comments and further questions in the comment section. And good luck to you all this winter season. Thank you a lot. Appreciate it.